morning. How's everybody doing today? All right. Everybody get out of the grub line and take a seat. Jeez. We tried. We're changing the name of the church to East Mountain Grub Church. <laughs> Here's the deal. If you're going to bring food, be here by 945. If you want to eat breakfast, be here by 10. <laughs> here you go. Good grief. It's ridiculous. We had to add another table just to get all the food in. So, uh, but it's good to see you. We'll let some folks stop talking back there and get in here and sit down. Everybody have a good week? Good week, good deal. Good deal. Starting to get a little chilly, a little chilly, chilly. So I'm, I'm so excited. Uh, 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 there she is. There she is. Okay. All right. Well, I tell you what, it's an exciting day because uh, Marcella's here. Yeah. Marcella, Marcella, she's back here against the wall, right back there, sitting by the ugly guy. And, uh, so, hi, Marcella. We missed you. We love you. We prayed for you. We're so excited that you're here. And finally, we can get David under control. Amen. <laughs> finally, finally, finally. So, but, uh, hey, I'm just going to make an announcement right now. I'll say something about it again a little bit later. Um, but uh, you need to be here next week. You need to be here next week. Don't miss next week. All right. Uh, if you miss next week, you're going to miss some big news uh, about our future. And uh, God has just kind of opened some doors that are ridiculous. And uh, so uh, we're, we're working on all the details. Don't you say a word, Eric. Don't tell her. She's got a big mouth. She'll go tell everybody. Yeah. She, she, she heads up our prayer team. She'll send out a prayer thing. We need to pray, dear God. And, you know, it's like they're praying for it. And it's really gossip. So, uh, but, uh, so. Uh, In Jesus' name. Anyway, I can say that. In Jesus' name. So, huh? In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah. So, anyway, yeah, it's going to be great. And we're excited about it. So, uh, so good to see you today. Everybody, if, you, if you're visiting with us today, thank you for being here today. Uh, we know you have opportunity to go to a lot of other churches. And uh, we hope that you have the best experience uh, of being at a church that's friendly. Uh, if you see somebody and you're a guest and they don't say hi to you, you have my permission as the pastor to reach up and slap them. And because uh, we have to remind our people, we just want to be obnoxiously friendly. And uh, it amazes me how many times people come out of church and just say uh, it wasn't friendly. I remember years ago, visited a cowboy church in, in Texas and uh, uh, they got up and everybody shook hands and did all that. And we stood there and people walked around us. You know, it was like I had the plague or something. And then when, when church was over, we were walking out and everybody was shaking the pastor's hand. And when we got to him, he turned and started talking to some other people. And uh, so I thought, you know what? We'll never do that in any church that I'm a part of. We're going to be friendly. We're going to be loving. Uh, and uh, we want people to feel like... Uh, that uh, they're welcome. We got a bunch of chairs over here. If you guys like chairs, isn't that a problem? You have to put out more chairs. We got plenty, uh, but that's a neat thing. So if you would, everybody stand up, turn around, look at somebody that you don't know, and say, You're friendly. You're friendly. I'm ready here for you. Today we're starting a new series called Going Deep. 
and the next <laughs> the next five weeks we're going to be dealing with some pretty tough subjects today we're going to start uh, off deep and we're going to what the bible says about alcohol and addictions i think somebody's trying to tell me something <laughs> These were, these were behind there, so who, whoever did that, shame on you, you're feeding my addiction. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we always take a time to pray and, and uh, we believe in prayer. We have seen God do some incredible things. And I really believe, folks, that one of the reasons that God's found favor on us is because we put prayer at the front of what we do. And uh, we, uh, we have a prayer team, and if you'd like to be a part of that, Joanne uh, leads that team. See her. She is, she is just passionate about making sure that needs get out. And uh, so we take time in the beginning of our service just to pray and uh, pray for specific needs if people bring them to us. Uh, thank God for what he's doing in, in the midst of this church. And uh, folks, I'm just here to tell you that if things play out, how they started this week, it is just going to be ridiculous. It really, really is. Uh, we're not talking small, we're talking massive uh, and what God's going to do. And uh, it just kind of, uh, when, when it was all said and done, those of us that were sitting at the meeting looked at each other and went, did, did that just happen? <laughs> you know? and, and I shared it with one guy and he said, well, what would you expect? That's what God does. And I'm like, hey, hey, I'm the pastor. You can't outfake me. <laughs> you can't outfake me. Who do you think you are? So uh, anyway, he outfaithed me and because uh, I'm just still kind of stunned. But we just got to work through some of the details this week and then we'll, we'll share it with you. And then after we share it with you, We'll come back the following week, give the church about a week to pray about it, ask questions, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there. So uh, just be praying, but I'm just going to leave you. Don't go around asking people, okay? Don't go, what you talking about? What you talking about? Okay, okay, I'll tell you, the, truck, the church brought me a new truck, okay? So uh, that's, that's what it is. So, so now, now, now you know, the cat's out of the bag, okay? So David, come up and lead us. David's going to lead us in prayer this morning. So, uh, and if, for those who are visiting, this is David, our associate pastor, and Marcella. Uh, look, she's already back in charge of the hot. Look at her; she's already up. She's already, That's Marcella, and she's. This is David's wife. She retired, and then five days later, has got sick and has been in the hospital for on and off for four months. And uh, we have prayed, and uh, that thing back there is her deal. And Gail was so afraid that when Marcella showed up today that things weren't going to be the way they were supposed to be. So I've had to, I've had to, I've had to give Gail Xanax. Uh, I've had to pray with her this morning to get her calmed down because we knew that, that Marcella was coming back. Next week she'll have the whip. She didn't bring the whip this week. Uh, but I just want to introduce you so you'll know who we're talking about. Brother. Yeah, this morning... Um Kurt went to the gas station over at Cedar Crest, and there was a lady there. So, what are you all dressed up for? He says, "I'm not dressed up." Says, uh, something about what are you doing? And so, I'm I'm going going to work. So, what do you do? He said, "Well, I'm a pastor at a company church." Really? And uh, she said, "Well, you would you pray for my father?" The Hispanic lady. Uh, her father is dying of cancer. His name is Juan. And so, let's pray for him that God will just give him peace in his heart. Make sure he's right with God and also with the family and uh, minister to them, even do a miracle and uh, have him recover. Are there any other requests? We keep praying for Marcella, just a, kind of a selfish thing here, but uh, she's, uh, she's got stuff on her neck. In case she looks like she's, she's wired up, she still has a heart monitor, which is, they're just, uh, that's up until the 28th of uh, September and we take it off. They're just checking out to make sure there's no quivers there. And, uh, but uh, she's getting stronger little by little. She drove here all the way from Estancia. She says, I'm all over the road. <laughs> so, anyway, she's got to go back to the, the cow pass. Okay, anything else? Yes, somebody. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we've, uh, like, what is it, 15 or 1600 dollars? 16? So far with Daniel. So we're going to. I am, I am trusting the Lord to make it 2,000 today altogether. Um, we certainly can do that. Daniel is a, is a 10 year old boy who needs some serious operation and surgery business up in Denver. 
with some specialists and uh, let's pray the family has no money and uh, so we're taking up an offering to uh, help them live on for the next couple of weeks well starting the 8th of October in Denver while they're while he's having surgery and recovery so let's pray for him he had a brother died with the very same disease so this is really a critical thing and let's pray for them yes somebody else had how what yeah yeah she said every day he says how he's scared let's God let's ask God to give him peace and courage and I mean 10 year old boy facing major surgery it's not fun so let's uh, let's keep praying for him and it's true, uh, we start Bible study. We have Bible study Thursday nights. We have like 29 or 30 people there this Thursday. We start with prayer. Um, a lot of discussion sometimes, but uh, we start with prayer and ask God to really intercede. And some real needs here in this church. Some of our regular people are having some real serious needs. So let's pray for them, shall we? If you would just take a, a moment to uh, pray silently with yourself for things that are on your heart and uh, link our faith together. It's really, really important. Lord, it's just us here this morning. We're here waiting on you, wanting you to speak to us, wanting you to touch us, touch our families. There are those of our friends and relatives maybe that are not here this morning that maybe ought to be or we think they ought to be but in any case Lord you're not restricted by a building and we thank you Father that you can touch the hearts even of Daniel not here this morning but I pray that you just watch over him come alongside him help him to feel in reality the arms of faith around him to know that Jesus cares he loves you and I pray that you just give him peace Give him courage, give him strength, and uh, heal his body. May the surgeons and all the doctors involved be unusually guided by your spirit. Loving Lord, we pray for this, this dear man who's dying of cancer. His name is Juan. Lord, you know his name, and uh, you're there with him. Pray, Father, that you would touch his heart. Um, Helping to know right now that you're, there's a very special presence with him in his room, wherever he's at. Be with his daughter there at the gas station. Give her peace. Give her strength. Help her father to uh, get close to you. Even as she asked the pastor to pray for him, I pray that you'd help us to uh, lift her up and that you would bring her and her father Juan to our minds during the week and the time to come. We pray, Father, for your grace. Uh, pray for Marcella, minister to her physically, and uh, thank you for holding her steady and getting her through this turmoil. I <clears throat> pray, Father, that you would just continue to finish the work that the uh, doctors have, have started and that, Lord, soon this, uh, this whole ordeal will be totally behind her thank you Lord for your mercy what a what an incredible thing it is Lord we could show mercy we could show kindness we can show love and tolerance but Lord you're the master you're the master of it and we thank you father that you love us that you care for us and I pray that now for this next hour that you will touch every single individual person here that we will be uh, an audience of one listening to you to your word Lord may you touch us may you strengthen us may you give us wisdom understanding help us Lord to humble ourselves before you and Lord we'll just give you the praise for the mighty things that you're doing in our church and with our church and with our folks bless Lord we pray that these many people will reach out and touch others that the congregation that is really touched by you this morning will be two three times bigger than it is here father we thank you for your grace again ask Lord that you'd guide us through this next hour minister to us bless the music thank you Lord for those folks providing it minister to 
Kurt, Lord, minister to him and through him to us. We pray in Jesus' precious, wonderful name. Amen. I gotta find my cheaters. This next song we're gonna sing Larry. kind of a story of my life. You know, I was it's okay. raised in a in a in a in a pretty poor home. And then I joined the church when I was nineteen. And I became an elder in that church. But I was contemplating suicide on a regular basis, looking at bridge banisters and telephone poles until after I was 40 years old. This song kind of speaks to me and, and may speak to some of you folks. For sharing that. We're going to go on to another song. Karen um, brought this to uh, me a few weeks back while she was telling us about it. And this is one that I've heard a lot. If you listen to Caleb or the Family Life, you know, channel, the Christian, um, it's We Believe. And it starts off low. I can sing low, but sometimes a little low goes really low. So I'm going to ask y'all for some help because they like to jump around. So we're going to... Um, so if you hear me like grumbling, just help me out here.
going to now um, do a song for us called Dear Lord Forgive. And uh, while we're getting ready for that, uh, the kids can be dismissed to go back yonder. If I
worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship. All right. Well, if you were with us last week, uh, and or you're with us today for the first time, we jumped off in a new series. We're going to spend the next five weeks dealing with some tough topics, topics that are shaping and. The format of the country we live in, it's shaping our morality. And a lot of times I found out that there are issues that churches don't want to address because they're afraid that if they address them, that uh, it might impact attendance, it might offend people. And quite frankly, I'm not really concerned if I offend you (laughs) because I believe it's biblical. And, uh, you know, there's the old saying that says, one guy said, some people come to... uh, comfort the afflicted. Other, another guy said, I come to afflict the comfortable. And so today we're going to jump off in a topic that, uh, let me understand, I'm going I'm to make sure that you understand that uh, in any of these topics we deal with, there is no judgment, there is no condemnation, everything will be from a biblical perspective. I will give you the resources to go and to look and find for yourself because many times these subjects are subjects that we just hear somebody preach about or speak about and therefore we think. And I can tell you, uh, I've been in church all of my life. Uh, I was, I had a drug problem when I was a kid. I was drugged to church. Uh, you've heard that. I was drugged to church. I mean, if a church door was open, I was there. And in, in my entire life, folks, I have never, through college and getting a degree in theology and communication, through seminary and getting a master's in theology, I have never in my life heard a message like I'm going to share with you today. Never. I've heard one side of it. But I've never heard the other side of it. And so today I'm going to give you both sides. And I'm going to give you a ton of scripture. In fact, if you look at the bulletin uh, on the back, our subject today is what's the Bible say about alcohol. On the back of the bulletin, there are 25 passages of scripture. If you want to go and look at it and see for yourself, feel free to do it. So wherever you are in the journey in life, whatever your challenge is or your challenge isn't, this is not to pass condemnation. It's simply to say this is what the Word of God has to say and everything that I'm saying today I want to say up front. It is wrapped in, 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 in love. It's wrapped in grace. It's wrapped in mercy to help us be better equipped. And at the end of the day on all these subjects that we're going to deal with over the next five weeks, tough subjects, subjects that, that our government's dealing with, subjects that impact our, our livelihood, subjects that impact our, our moral values, impact our kids, and all of them, here's what it boils down to. It doesn't boil down to my opinion. In fact, I don't want you to take my opinion. That's why I'm going to overload you, okay? Because you need to decide where you fit on the scale. But it boils down to one thing, folks, and that is what God means to you. That's what it boils down to. It just simply boils down to that fact. Is God a legitimate part of my life? Am I living my life to know him, to grow in him? Or is he just my convenient get out of jail card? Or is he my spiritual ATM card that I can run down and when I'm in trouble, I just reach out and say, God, help me. So it all boils down to that. You know, and, and that's, that's where it is. The problem with churches today and the problem with Christians today, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, is that too many people go to church and they listen without going and finding out for themselves. And many times they become misinformed because, believe it or not, pastors are human and many times they have agendas. Uh, my agenda, folks, the best I can is just to say, here's what the Bible says. 
So I am going to give you a ton of information today and we're going to go fast. It may be more like a, a lesson <laughs> rather than a message because I'm going to give you a lot of biblical information. We're going to go fast, quick, and in a hurry. So if you want to write it down, write it down. If not, you know we're on YouTube, and for those that are joining on YouTube, it's crazy. I get feedback every week. We got people in Alaska. We got people in Florida. We got people in Puerto Rico. It's crazy how people are, are listening to us. And uh, so uh, I didn't even know there's cowboys in Puerto Rico. And uh, so uh, uh, and we're, I found out today we're going to have to have a section for those that uh, have uh, allergies to cowboy churches. I found out Ben went to a doctor today, uh, this week and he had an allergy test and he's allergic to cattle. So uh, Ben, you have to sit over here in the allergy section, okay? That's where we're going to put you. This whole subject about what the Bible really says about drinking is probably one of the biggest debates that the church has dealt with in literally the last hundred years. It has probably caused more damage. In fact, I'll go as far as say this on record. A can of beer has caused more damage to the body of Christ than most things that I know about. Because people want to become judgmental over a can of beer. And we're going to find out at the end of this message that the key thing that God is most concerned about is not whether somebody feels it's okay to drink or not drink, but the key thing is peace and unity in the body of Christ. That's the key thing. And that's where we're going to be heading. So let me just share with you some information that probably some of you don't know, but I'm going to give you a lot of information. There are 247 references in the Bible pertaining to alcohol. 40 are negative regarding drunkenness, fighting, and dissension, and in sexual encounters. We'll get to that. 145 of the 247 verses are positive. 145 verses in the entire scripture are positive when it comes to relating to God and how he communicates to people and we're going to get into that and have a relationship. 62 are neutral addressing false accusations. And we're going to see the false accusations. Did you know that Jesus was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard by the Pharisees? Of the 145 verses that are, that are positive in the scripture, it deals with God's blessings in people's lives. But here's the truth. Every message I've ever heard have been on the 40. Have been about how bad it's been and that there is no room. That they're the majority. When it comes to dealing with wine, wine has a very, very specific place in how God interacts. In fact, I'll say this on the front end. What did Jesus say at Passover? And he said, this wine represents what? My blood. Why would Jesus say, and so some people will say, well, it was grape juice. Absolutely not. And I'll share with you that most people want to debate the fact that when it talks about wine in the New Testament or Old Testament, that it was grape juice. Not the case. Historically not the case. It is not the case. And any person that has studied this, in fact, the most conservative colleges and seminaries, in fact, Criswell Seminary, where at First Baptist Dallas, which was one of the most conservative Southern Baptist churches where W.A. Criswell pastored it for 45 years they wrote a paper at that seminary saying that alcohol and wine was definitely a fermented juice it was alcoholic there was no juice in the Bible that was referencing wine that was not alcoholic it's just a factual thing now were there levels of it yes and we'll get into that in a little bit so here's the truth. Scripture does not forbid drinking. It does condemn drunkenness and abuse. Of the 40 passages of Scripture, they all deal with drunkenness and abuse. And that's where the majority of evangelicals will go to. Because they have a hard time, in my perception, grasping the fact. Sin is, and let me just quote this, sin is defined in the Bible. And J.B. Phillips, who was a well-known uh, theologian, wrote this. Sin is defined as lawlessness. Everyone who commits sin breaks God's law. For that is what sin is by definition, a breaking of God's law. 
So here's the question that we need to ask. Did God create a law forbidding the use of alcohol? If he did, then we could easily conclude. But there is no law forbidding alcohol or wine. There is drunkenness. 1 John 3, 4 says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. The issue is, does the Bible have a law against alcohol? It has different types of alcohol. There is where it talks about strong drink. Strong drink was a mixture of wine that was fermented. It was a mixture of pomegranate juice. It was a mixture of different grains. It was a mixture of different fruits. And it did have the alcohol content of strong alcohol today. Your whiskeys, your bourbons. But historically, based on all studies, the wine that the Bible talks about had an alcohol content of 7 to 10 percent. All of it, whether it was new wine, aged wine, or the good wine. And the Bible talks about that. The aged wine, the new wine, and the good wine. So I'm going to give you a few of the scriptures that most people use when it comes to dealing with alcohol and saying that it is a sin if you drink alcohol. Proverbs 20 verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. That is true. But that's a negative verse. What's it deal with? It deals with drunkenness. It deals with the inability to use wisdom. And what does it say? Wine is a mocker. Wine is a mocker when it's used in excess. Strong drink creates brawls. <laughs> okay? How many of you can testify to that? Amen. All right. The rest of you are liars. All right? And how many of us, when we had too much strong drink, we weren't very wise? Okay? All right. So that's a fact. 1 Timothy 3.8. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not giving too much wine. It doesn't say no wine, it says too much wine. And many people will try to take that word much and they'll try to manipulate it in the Greek language saying all wine and that is absolutely not true. The next verse is in Isaiah 5.11. Woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink who continue until night till wine inflames them. Once again, they'll take that and build a case on it. The theme in these passages of scripture is not what God condemns when it comes to drinkiness. It's what he condemns when it comes to drunkenness. So there is a difference. So is drinking alcohol according to the scripture a sin? Yes and no. No if it's done in moderation. No if it's not strong drink. But if drunkenness is a part of it. Yes, it leads to that and I'll share with you why. Remember this and everything I say through these next five weeks as we get into things like abortion, like how the church is supposed to respond to abortion, how the church is supposed to respond to homosexuality, how the church is supposed to deal with politics. Remember, in all of those things that we're going to get into, everything that God says, he gives us for a reason to protect us. We have a free will. And he gave us common sense. Unfortunately, some of us take advantage of our free will and have no common sense. <laughs> Do not nudge your husbands, all right? That's the truth. And so what God does is God out of free will, out of love says, I give you a free will. But I'm also going to give you some stipulations and some guidelines that are going to help you benefit from the free will and to better use common sense. But it's your choice. It's your choice how you respond to me. And based on your choice, there will be outcomes. And so God puts this in the Word of God. He gives us descriptions about what's allowed when it comes to drinking and not drinking because he wants us not to to make bad choices. When you look at Luke 21, 34, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness by the worries of life. Don't let that day catch you unaware. Once again, the theme is drunkenness. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. And like I said, I'm going to load you up with scripture because I want you to walk out of here and understand what the Bible really says. 
When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, once again, free will, we have our choice, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of angers, selfish ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let me pause right there because some of you are going, well, you know, I, I, I've struggled with some of those things in my life. I know somebody struggled with those things in my life. And I know I'm a Christian, so what are you saying? I'm not going to heaven? No, that's not what I'm saying. Understand this. That the only sin, if you've come to a place that you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, ask Him into your life, the only thing that can keep you from going to heaven is rejecting Jesus. Okay? That's the only sin. It's the rejection of Jesus. It's quenching the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that that time comes in your life that for some reason you feel like, hey, God's drawn me to him. That's the Holy Spirit moving. And when it says you quench him, you cut him off, you reject Jesus. So if I become a Christian when I'm 15 and then later in life I get sucked into this stuff, do I lose my salvation? No. I do not lose my salvation, but I do not know God. I do not understand his power. I do not experience his power on a daily basis. I do not get through life with his strength and power. I do not experience his blessings. And until I address that in my life, I am never going to know God the way he desires to know me. How's that? Because sin is in the way. So I use this illustration. Husbands and wives, you get in a fight. What happens when you get in a fight? Don't tell me, I don't want to know. <laughs> what happens is communication stops. Isn't that true? Communication stops. And until somebody goes back and says, I'm z I'm z I'm sorry, communication doesn't exist. Somebody has to go back. Somebody has to open the door. The Bible says in Revelations that Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door by the cross, Jesus is at the door knocking. We have to open it. We have to address the sin in our life to him. He's already done the ultimate there is no greater display of love ever shown to mankind than what happened 2,000 plus years ago when Jesus went to the cross. Nobody. The Bible says Jesus said, I laid down my life for my friends. Now here's the amazing thing. He calls you and I his friends. We're his friends. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. So if you're struggling with any of these things in Galatians 5, the bottom line is, do I, have I lost have I lost my salvation? No. You cannot lose your salvation. And if you've been taught that, there's one verse in the book of Hebrews and in the fourth chapter and they take one verse and they build a whole belief system off that you can lose your salvation and it's not, any, it's not near contextually right when you look at how it was written in the original language. You cannot lose your salvation. Can you lose the power of God in your life? Absolutely. So in the old days, we called it backslidden, you know. Remember that? You're backslidden, all right? And, you know, so you're just away from God. You, you've got to deal with it. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Do not you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or the thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. If you've done that once in your life, that still exists. But there may be years of pain. The enemy is going to take those years of pain and he's going to beat you up. He's going to make you feel unworthy. He's going to make you feel like you can't experience God's forgiveness. Look at all the bad things I've done. And let me tell you, there is nothing that anybody in this room has ever done that exceeds the grace of God. 
And if you believe that, you've bought into a lie. All right? You've bought into a lie. Now, an article that was written in a, a, a magazine called Life, Hope, and Truth by Graham Marshall said this. After years of study in the scripture, he came back and he says this. So no, scripture does not forbid all drinking of beer, wine, or any drink containing alcohol unless strong drink. Alcohol consumed in moderation is not harmful for most people. Some health authorities even recommend small amounts of red wine for its healthful benefits. Do you know why Jesus referenced wine to his blood? Do you know what wine can do also? It cleanses. We lived in Texas. I had a, I had a, a, a filly and she was out in the pasture and she wouldn't come up with the rest of the horses. And I walked out there and, and something had gotten her and, and literally from her shoulder all the way across her chest just ripped it and it just laid down. I mean it was just wide open. And, and so I called my vet and I said, what do I do? And you know what the first thing he said? He said, you need to cleanse it. And I said, what do I use? He said, you got a bottle of red wine? I said, seriously? He said, yeah. Now, if you have a bottle of red wine, he said, just, you know, pour all over it and cleanse it. And he said, you know, just get her here as soon as you can. And, and that's what he recommended to people that were out if they're ranching or stuff like that. He'd always tell these guys, you know, and, and you know, I figured he knew stuff because, you know, most of the guys in the top 15 in PRCA, that's where their horses went to this vet. So, you know, I figured, hey, you know, I got wine unless a you know, horse gets hurt. And if I get thirsty, hey, you no, know, just get. Okay. In, an art, in, a, in an article called Doctrine and Devotion, the plain truth is the best scholars argue consistently and clearly that not only is the wine of the Bible alcoholic, maintaining unfermented grape juice would be virtually impossible. D.F. Watson states in his article in the Dictionary of, the, of Jesus and the Gospels, in his article on wine, all wine mentioned in the Bible is fermented grape juice with alcoholic content. No non-fermented drink was called wine. Now, I don't know how that makes you feel, folks, because I, it kind of rattled my cage a little bit from traditional beliefs, but I had to look at this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you a little further, and this may rattle some people's cages, but in Luke 7, 33 through 34, here's what Jesus said. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread, drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. So because he wasn't drinking wine and eating bread... The people said he was a demon. Well, what's that say to you culturally? Culturally, it said that you didn't do that. All right? So, and then it goes on, and he said, he's a demon. The son of man, that's Jesus, has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him. He is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. What Jesus was saying is he was differentiating between how John the Baptist came and how Jesus came. And the words in the Greek there dealing with wine is the Greek word oinos, which means wine. When Jesus said he came eating and drinking. So according to this passage of scripture, Jesus drank wine. Wine was a cultural drink of the day because water was so limited and the water was full of impurities. And so that rattles some people's cages because all of a sudden you go, well, Jesus didn't sin. Well, if Jesus didn't sin and Jesus was drinking wine according to the text, what does that say? Because the Bible says later on, Paul says that Jesus was without sin. He was the only perfect one. So Jesus is making this, 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 this distinction. And as I said last week, Nazarites who took the Nazarene oath didn't drink wine. It also told us that religious leaders, that they were attempting to call Jesus a drunkard, therefore a sinner, but yet his very first miracle was what? Was wine. Because his mother stuck her nose in his business, all right? which moms have a tendency of doing. So in John 2.10, I love you moms. Uh, okay. Yeah, I better say it quick. Uh, in John 2.10, well, my computer's going crazy here. 
it talks about Jesus and his first miracle. Let me get it back here. When the master of the ceremonies tested the water that was now wine, the water was now wine because Jesus told the servants to get water and pour it in a vat. Not knowing where he had come from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. And here's the tradition, folks. A host always serves the best wine first. It was tradition in Jewish culture. Wine was always at parties. It was always at a feast. It was the best of the best to offer your guest. He said, hey, so the host always serves the best wine. First, he said, this is what the bridegroom, he said to the bridegroom. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. As I said, the, the Greek word for wine in this text is the, Greek, the word oinos, and it is the word that is used throughout the New Testament describing wine, and it implies it was fermented wine. So as I got to going through this, I said, well, I'm going to look at a couple things throughout Scripture to see what the wine was. So I looked at the Passover. And I thought to myself, well, it was the Passover. When Jesus sat down and they came in and Jesus had the Last Supper, was that wine? And so as I began to study at it, here's what I found out. According to Jewish law, and I checked this out for modern times as well as older times, People will say, well, there was no fermented wine in the New Testament because there was no yeast. And because there's no yeast and there's no sugar. According to Jewish law, and this is according to a Jewish rabbi, there are hundreds of species of yeast. But the Passover prohibition only applies to yeast, which is a product of one of the following five grains. Wheat, barley, oat, spelt, and rye. Yeast, grapes produce their, its own yeast. And grapes produce its own sugar. And when it talks, Jesus said the fruit of the vine, the Passover took place in the spring, but the harvest for the grapes was in the fall. So when it talks about new wine, New wine is referring grapes picked in the fall, which means they had fermented in their own yeast and their own sugar for months. Now, based on Jewish law at the Passover, the priest, and during Old Testament festivals, the priest could by law determine if the wine was diluted with water. But that was according to Jewish law up to the priest based on certain conditions. So do you see where we're going with this? Do you see that there is a pattern that goes through scripture that, that says wine is an okay thing outside of drunkenness? That, that it was a part of the culture even to the place that Jesus said this wine represents my body, my blood, I mean the blood, the blood did what? It cleansed our sins. What does wine do? It cleanses infirmities. That's why Jesus chose that. Jesus chose that because Jewish in Israel was an agricultural country. They lived on agriculture. I and mean, if you follow the teachings of Jesus, he always used agricultural terms. He used stories that were relational to the people so they could understand. And so when it comes to this passage... Wine at the Passover was fermented. It was not a drink, a, a non-fermented drink. Uh, and so research of culture, I already mentioned this, says that it's 7 to 10 percent of it. Now, drinking wine or alcohol is not the issue. The issue is when it has become sin. And it becomes sin when drunkenness gets involved. This is the passage that most people will jump on in most messages that I've heard. And one of the things I found out, and I hope you understand the context, if I stand up here and I get off on this hardcore thing about drinking wine and drinking alcohol, and I come across judgmental and, and, and condemning people, now help me, follow me on this, okay? And I don't want anybody to take this personal. 
and I'm 75 pounds overweight, what are you thinking? You, you with me on this? What's the Bible say about gluttony? So does that mean that if I drink wine, I'm automatically going to get drunk? It's like saying if I eat food, I'm automatically going to get 75 pounds overweight. You see, because you, you can't preach one thing that the Bible teaches against, but then ignore something else. Okay? I mean, how many messages have, have we heard preached in our lifetime where somebody gets up and talks about gluttony? All right? Because we don't want to offend people. We, we want to put that to the side. But the truth is, we live in a country that, according to what I read this week, we are the most overweight country in the world. And so I stand up and I'm going to talk to you about how you shouldn't drink and how it's this and this and this, you know, and, 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 and it's obvious that I got an eating problem. But I don't want to talk to you about that because now it's personal. Because <laughs> I'm the preacher. You see, you've got to be consistent when it comes to dealing with the truth. You cannot take parts of the Bible and make it fit for a hidden agenda. I may not be overweight, but I may be unhealthy in how I take care of myself. I may be unhealthy in how I eat, which I am, but that's okay. All right? God loves me. All right? What does the Bible say? The Bible says if you're a believer, you were bought with a price... And that our bodies are what? A temple. We're a temple. So if I abuse my body, whether it's through drinking, whether it's through eating, or whether it's, you know, not taking care of myself, not taking high blood pressure, not making sure that, you know, I, I you know, you got bad back and I abuse my back. And, you know, doctor says you've got 30 herniated discs, which I do, and I'm supposed to not do things, but I don't listen. You know, the truth is, guess what? I'm abusing what? The temple. So it boils down to what you believe in Scripture about who you are if you have a personal relationship with Christ. If you don't have a personal relationship with Christ, it's a mute issue. Knock yourself out until it doesn't work for you anymore and you learn the hard way. But this is what it boils down to. This is just not an issue about drinking. It's an issue about understanding who we are in Christ. So, Galatians, well, let me read Proverbs 23, 29 through 35. Who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? Who is always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Sounds like my teen years. It is the one who spends long hours in taverns trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. A snake. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations. <laughs> uh, and, and you will say crazy things. <laughs> okay, you bunch of liars. All right, next week's on lying. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging in a swaying mast. It's the picture here. You know, in the sea... Sailors would, they would, in a hammock, and as they would go, they would be doing this, and it's swinging back and forth, and that's what it's saying. It's doing to your ability to make judgments, the ability to think. Uh, and you will say, they hit me, <laughs> but I didn't feel it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't even know when they beat me up. <laughs> when will I wake up so I can look for another drink? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I just laughed because I don't know about some of you, but there's times I woke up in college going, what happened? <laughs> when, when did I get hit? You don't remember what you did last night? Uh, and, and we've all been there, right? I mean, it, it, it's true. I mean, this was written thousands of years ago, but it's realistic and it's true. Now, Galatians 5.21 says, Envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone who lives this sort of life as a way of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let me bring it home to you. Why does God put this stuff in here? Let me just bring it down to modern day. He brings it down to us and he puts this stuff in here because God is all-knowing. He understands the human condition. It's broken. 
37% of all sexual assaults and pregnancies and rape, 37% alcohol involved. 41% of all murders in America, alcohol involved. 58% of majority fights that cause bodily harm, alcohol, slander, slander. All right, I don't even have to give that one on it. 15% of all home robberies in America, alcohol, death, DUIs, prison. 40% of inmates admit that they had alcohol in their system when they committed crime. Gun crimes. This one is crazy right here. Suicide. Alcoholics are 120 times more likely to commit suicide. Every 40 seconds, a person commits suicide in this country and 29% of them have severe levels of alcohol in their system. 27% of aggravated assaults related to alcohol, 35% of child abuse related to alcohol, 55% of, of domestic violence related to alcohol. Every day, 29 people in the U.S., and this is according to government figures, every day, 29 people in the U.S. die in car wrecks involving an impaired driver. You know what impaired driver is, according to the law? Two drinks. Two drinks, folks. It's not alcoholic, it's not drunk, two drinks. That equals one death every 50 minutes in America. And the cost for the taxpayer per year is $44 billion. Not to mention what alcohol causes the over-exaggerated, I'm a tough guy. See, there's protection in, in, in God's word to keep us from hurting ourselves. The, the, the reason why God comes across for some of us so hard sometimes is because we don't want to deal with the reality all right, of where we are in our lives. There was a kid that was in a church that I started in Tampa, Florida back in 1990. He was eight years old when we started that church. Years later, I found out good parents, great home, educated kid, went to college. Years later, I found out he was in prison. You know, he's in prison. He and his buddy went drinking, Ybor City in Tampa. He was getting on the freeway, impaired, hit another car, killed his passenger. He went to prison for manslaughter. Ruined his life. Came out of prison hard kid. Felt he was worthless because he took another life. And then with all the things that happened in prison. But they were just out for a good time. You know what a good time does when it involves alcohol? It ruins the rest of the good times in life. Because just like that, no person no person, no person has the capability and the ability to be 100% sure that when they consume enough alcohol, which according to our state and national statistics is two drinks, two beers, puts you over the limit. Nobody has the guarantee that they can make it home safe. And not only is it their life that's destroyed, it's their family's life that's destroyed, it's their kids if they're married, and it's the family of the other people. Now that's tragic. In Tampa, Florida, a kid, 18-year-old kid, had a pretty fast car, had a couple of beers. He decided he was going to race a buddy as his home. And he took off as fast as he could. A mom with her daughter came around the corner, came around that corner every day, made that turn every day, had no idea a kid doing 125 miles an hour was coming. Hit that van, that van exploded into fire, flames. They were on their way home to meet husband and dad because they were going to Colorado to see brother graduate from college. Dad was at home waiting they didn't come home. He called, couldn't get a hold of him, decided to get in his car and see if he could find him, came around the corner, and that was his wife and daughter. And he listened to the screams of his wife and daughter burned to death. Now, you ready for this? That boy went to prison, and that father went to prison and said to this young man, I forgive you. 
His own parents and family disowned him, but the father of the wife and daughter adopted him. Not legally, but took him under his wing. And you know when that kid got out of school, or out of prison, they traveled throughout the country speaking to high school kids. You want to talk about forgiveness? You want to talk about understanding the power of forgiveness? This man was a Christian. This kid wasn't a Christian. He now is. And he's now in the ministry. That's the power. And this kid had raced a jillion times. And he'd gotten away with it. But that one time, there's no guarantee. What we think is a good time for a few hours ends up costing us our life. Proverbs 23 says, Don't carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons. Proverbs 21, or 20 verse 1 says, Wine produces mockers. We talked about that. In the book of Habakkuk, What sorrow awaits you? Now listen to this. This is going to get home. What sorrow awaits you who make your neighbors drunk? You force your cup on them so you can gloat over their shameful nakedness. In the book of Deuteronomy 21.20, rebellious kids who got drunk were stoned by their own parents. In Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, drunkenness was the reason that the nation of Israel and Judah were sent into captivity and exile. Kings and princes were told and were not allowed to have anything to do with wine because of, it would corrupt their leadership. And Jesus refused wine on the cross so his judgment would not be impaired because it was traditional for women to go to crucifixions and mix wine with myrrh and it was basically a, 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 it was a, a narcotic and they would put it on a sponge and give it to the person on the cross so the pain would go away and Jesus denied it. He denied it because he needed to experience the pain of the sin of mankind. You see, the reason God gave us all this is because of the free will he gave us. And his ultimate goal is not only that we know him in a personal way, but that we experience John 10.10 10, when Jesus said, I've come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. That, that's why he did. So let me flip the coin real quick and I'm going to give you some of the flip sides of why alcohol or why wine was okay. We're, we're going to look at why it's not a sin. In Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, wine was a blessing from God for wise and obedient living. Here's what it says. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. How about that? Really? God's going to give me wine? He's going to bless me with wine? Why? Because wine was a product that people depended on. Because the water was not good. The water was not pure. Wine cleansed. Wine was a life giver to people. It was, it, it, it was used for cleansing. In Deuteronomy 28 and verse 39, the loss of wine was punishment for their disobedience. This is what Moses said. You will plant vineyards and care for them, but you will not drink the wine or eat the group, the, the group, the grapes. <laughs> for worms will destroy the vines. Why would God take that away? Because it was a sense of livelihood. It was a crop. It was a blessing to them. Exodus 29:40. Wine was an acceptable sacrifice to God. With one of them, offer two quarts of choice flour mixed with one quart of pure oil of pressed olives. Also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. When you would go, when they would go to make an offering, God would accept wine. Why? Because he knew what it was going to represent. What was it going to represent? The blood of Christ. The cleansing power of Christ. He knew that. In Leviticus... 23, with it you must present a grain offering consisting of four quarts of choice flour moistened with olive oil. It will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you must also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Why? Because of what the wine represented. 
the cleansing power of the blood. See, all the way through the scripture, folks, from Genesis to Revelation, they call it the crimson thread. The crimson thread. It's the lineage and the line. It's the blood of Jesus. It's all the way through the Bible. It just didn't happen, folks, when Jesus went to the cross. It started in Genesis 3, and it goes all the way to the end of the Bible when the story's done. In Judges 9.13, God gave wine to cheer the heart. <laughs> this is going to rock your world. But the grapevine also refused, saying, Should I quit producing the wine that cheers both God and people? Some of you are going, Woohoo! Party in our house. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> Should I quit producing the wine that cheers both God and people just to wave back and forth over the trees? In Psalms 104, 14 through 15, you cause grass to grow for the livestock and plants for people to use. You allow them to produce food from the earth, wine to make them glad, olive oil to soothe their skin, and bread to give them strength. The sixth thing that we find out from the scripture is that abundant wine is one of the blessings of the age to come. When you get a chance, go read Isaiah 24. In my Bible, it starts and it says the destruction of the world. And it is the destruction of end times. It's what Isaiah sees. And here's what it says is going to happen in that time. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must pay the price for their sin. They are destroyed by fire and only a few are left alive. The grapevines waste away and there is no new wine. All the merrymakers sigh and mourn. The cheerful sound tambourines, the, the cheerful sound of tambourines is stilled. The happy cries of celebration are heard no more. The melody discords of the harp are silent. Gone are the joys of wine and song. Alcoholic drink turns bitter in the mouth. The city rise in chaos. Every home is locked to keep out the intruders. Mob gathers, mobs gather in the streets, crying out for wine. Joy has turned to gloom. Gladness has been banished from the land. Do, do you begin to understand here that wine was a symbol of God's provision? It was a symbol of God providing for them. And when the wine left, guess who left? God. His cleansing power, his forgiveness left. That's why people are mourning. Not because they, could, they couldn't get wasted, not because they couldn't get drunk, because it was a symbol of God's blessings because of what wine represented, power of cleansing. Seventh thing I want to share with you when it comes to what the power of wine is on the good side God invited his people to celebrate in his presence by drinking wine. Check this out, Deuteronomy 14, 23 through 26. This is going to rock some of you right here. Bring this tithe to the designated place of a worship. His people were to tithe. Now let me say something real quick, and, and I'm trying to get out of here quick. That, that, that we're going to talk about tithing, okay? So let me just say right now, some of you just passed out. Oh, great. Preacher's going to talk about tithing. Let me say something. Here's what I don't believe. I don't believe that the New Testament teaches 10%. I don't. The word tithe is never mentioned in the New Testament. It's an Old Testament mathematical word. means 10%. In Malachi, when it says don't rob from God, it had nothing to do with the church. It had everything to do with the fact that the Jewish people, the Leviticus people, were the priest. And the tithe that he was talking about was the salary that they paid the priest had nothing to do with the church. In fact, if we went by biblical use of tithe, according to the Old Testament, if we go by Malachi's 10%, we would be asked to tithe 33 and a third percent of everything we bring in. Okay? That's not New Testament giving. And we'll talk about that someday. All right? But, all right, some of you are going, well, just let us know because I'm not coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bunch of... You bunch of pagans. So, anyway, this passage of scripture is, is that this is one of their tithes. And it says, bring this tithe, 10%, to the designated place of worship, which the priest would tell. The place the Lord your God chose for his name to be honored. And eat there in his presence. This applies to your tithe of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn males of your family. I mean, of your flocks and herds. Did you get that as a little joke there? 
Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. What's it do? To fear the Lord your God. What's fear mean? To respect. It's to respect. That's what the word in Hebrew means. Now, when the Lord your God blesses you with a good harvest, the place of worship he chooses for his name to be honored might be too far for you to take the tithe. In other words, you got to take the grapes, you got to take the animals, you got to take the harvest. It may be too far to travel. So here's what he says. If it's too far for you to travel, he says, if so, you must sell the tithe portion of your crops and herds, put the money in a pouch, go to the place the Lord God has chosen you. You can get there now because you're not carrying all this stuff. When you arrive, you may use the money to buy any kind of food you want. Cattle, sheep, goats, wine, or other drink. Then feast there in the presence of your Lord God and celebrate with your household. That's God's permission right there, folks. It's in the Word of God. I bet you there's not very many people in here ever heard that, vo that verse when it came to a message on alcohol. Isaiah 62, 9 says, You raise the grain and you will eat it, praising the Lord. Within the courts of the temple, you yourselves will drink the wine you have pressed yourselves. Wine was appropriate for celebrations. The Song of Solomon, it says, He escorts me to the banquet hall. You know what the banquet hall translated in Hebrew was? It, limp, it literally meant the hall of wine. <laughs> in Song of Solomon, He took me to the hall of wine. It's obvious how much He loves me. Why? Because what, what wine represented? It was the good wine. Luke 5, 29, Jesus fellowshiped and ate with sinners with wine present. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as a guest of honor, and many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. The tax collectors were the crooks. They were the shady people. And guess what Jesus was doing? He was eating and drinking with them. <laughs> Jesus loved to throw parties. If you don't believe me, go read through the Gospels. Jesus was always looking for a feast. Why? Because a feast brought in who? The sinners. Because the religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people that thought they were better than, had so turned people off to the possibility of God's love and forgiveness that Jesus had to get down where they were and the best way to do it was to throw a party and hang out with them. Luke 15, it says, This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating and drinking with them. And the last thing it does, folks, as I've mentioned it several times, Jesus chose wine to represent his blood. He then took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. Then he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread and gave thanks to it for God. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and he said, this cup is the new covenant. You mean, what's the new covenant? The new covenant, see up until that time, there weren't Christians. Christians didn't come till after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Acts 2. The disciples still lived on the faith and the law of the Old Testament. But it was after Jesus died on the cross, the new covenant because in Jeremiah, he said, I'm going to have a new covenant and it's not going to be written on stone that you can break and throw away, but it's going to be written on your heart. And this was the new covenant. And he said, the wine represents this new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice to you. Let me read this to you in conclusion and then we're going to wrap it up. And folks, I, I don't apologize. 
this is serious stuff. People struggle with this. People's lives are ruined by it. People have lived under guilt with this. So I don't apologize if it takes a little bit more time to get into it. But I want to read this to you out of Romans 14. This is the message right here. And if you don't walk out with this, you missed everything that was said. Accept other believers who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything. And in that day, the argument was over. Did you, could you eat the meat that they would sacrifice? Could you not? That type of stuff. But another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servant? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, and with the Lord's help they will stand and receive approval. Sorry. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than the other day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it in honor Him. Those who eat or drink any kind of food or drink do it so to honor the Lord since they give thanks to God before eating or drinking. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scripture says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that there is unity and you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. So if you want to drink, you drink. But if you don't want another believer to stumble and fall, then you choose not to drink. This is not to endorse or not endorse. It's for you to decide between you and God what's right. Now for me, I don't drink. And the reason I don't drink is because I don't want people to go, well, the pastor drinks, so I don't want me to be the reason that another person uses to feed an addiction. So you'll never see me do that. Now, in the privacy of my home, have I ever had a good glass of homemade sangria? Uh-huh. But you won't see me do it in public because it's not important to me. It's not a necessity for me to have it's not worth the damage because I can promise you if somebody in this church saw me sitting over here at, at, at the pizza barn having a beer, I mean, that would be the topic of the town, you know? And I'd probably have preachers calling me up, condemning me to hell. And I'd say, well, come on over and let's have a beer and talk about it. <laughs> Don't let your eating ruin someone from who Christ died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but living a life of goodness and peace through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's it, folks. That's it. And if you leave today thinking it's okay for me to drink away, you missed everything I said. If you leave today and, and, and you don't understand that drinking wine was always in the context of giving thanks to God, it was life-sustaining, here's the deal. Drinking is between you and God, and what it boils down to at the end of the day is where God is in your life. If God is Lord of your life as a believer, then if you drink you will never abuse it because you understand the biblical context. If he's not, you'll abuse it to your convenience. 
And if you're here and you struggle with that as an addiction, as a substance, I am here to tell you that it's something behind the drink that's causing the drink. And whatever that is, we are committed to help people get through that. We will exercise all of our resources if it means helping a person get into a rehab facility, if it means sitting down with people who have addictions, who have been there. And I hope this gentleman doesn't mind me saying this, but a guy walked in today, said I hadn't been to church in forever. He said, I'm sober. And he told me how long he was sober. And this time, it was the first time I was at church. And I wanted to high five him and do all kind of stuff, but I didn't want to embarrass him. But he's been through it. We've got men and women who have been through it, have survived it. You just got to ask for help. Because I'm going to tell you this. This is what I know. When life is in pain, faith doesn't make a lot of sense. Two plus two doesn't equal four. You see, when I shared with you about that pastor that committed suicide a couple weeks ago who had mental illness for 30 years, somebody said, well... <laughs> Where was his faith? It wasn't a faith issue that caused his suicide. It was a mental issue, mental health issue. Faith was not in question. So sometimes when you have an addiction to something in life, somebody else has to be your faith. Somebody else has to walk with you for Jesus. Somebody else has to have the permission to jerk your chain to help you get back on track. And we're not afraid to deal with the tough issues here today. So please, I gave you my honesty about my life and drinking. If you're going to go tell somebody, tell them that. But don't go out and say, this pastor got out and preached and said, you know, drink away. Because that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, respect the word of God or don't. Respect the word of God or don't. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Father, sometimes these issues we don't want to hear about because we've all been down that road in different ways, in different issues. Gets too close to home. But God, in the end of the day, thank you for your love and forgiveness no matter what. Thank you, God, that we don't have to live trapped in that junk. Thank you, God, that uh, we can live to tell another day. Thank you that you provide healing. And Father, for those that are struggling today with this, God, I, I pray that they know that, number one, you love them unconditionally no matter what, no matter how bad, that you're for us all the time in every situation. Number two, this church loves them. We have to because you loved us. Number three, that I love them. And that I will do whatever I can and the resources of this church to help people so that they can live that abundant life that you came to give us. So Father, thank you for that today. You know, as we sit here and this piano plays, just if you wouldn't mind just keeping your head bowed. And if you're here today and you're struggling with something like this, I, I want to encourage you to come see me and let me see what I can do. Find resources to help you. There's people here that can tell you their story and how they survived. More important than if you're here today and you say, you know, there's never a time in my life that I've asked Christ into my life. I would be a failure as a pastor if I didn't say that, you know, today's the day you need to address that. Every one of us makes a decision every time we leave church, whether we're going to listen to what God says or not. And maybe God's saying to you, today's the day you need to do business and make me a part of your life, bring me into your life. Accept Christ as your personal Savior. thing I get to do is to share that message as much as I can. And God loves you. He's forgiven you. He's cleansed us. And he 
wants to have that relationship with you so that you can have the strength to get through this messy life. And so today it's just simple prayer. Father, I ask you into my life and thank you for Jesus on the cross. I believe that you died for me. Those few words change the direction and trajectory of your life. And that's why this church exists. And this is why we have big vision. Because we want to touch as many lives as we can. If you've done that today, there's a yellow form back there in the back table up by the door. You can get it and fill it out. David or I will follow up with you and do the best we can to help you. We'd love to know how we can help you in your spiritual life and your growth. Father, thank you for all you've done today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.